Hi, I'm Dr. John Michael Lau and I'm going to discuss to you the chapter on the heart. Um, basically, I will uh, give you a um, glimpse on uh, how this chapter will go, okay, but uh, in actuality, re you really have to read the chapter uh, because this is a relatively long one. So the learning outcomes are the following. Okay, so what I really want you to to be able to develop at the, at the end of our learning now is to be able to um, determine the pathophysiology and the causal relationship because these diseases are interrelated. No, but of course, since you're still beginners, you have to know each of the diseases, cardiac diseases, and this is the overview of our chapter so we'll be talking about um uh, heart failure in general okay and uh, about congestive heart failure talking we'll be talking about um congenital heart diseases ischemic heart diseases and that includes myocardial infarction um uh, arrhythmias which is a a, a, a consequence no a major consequence of myocardial infarction um Hypertensive heart diseases, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, pericardial diseases, and cardiac tumors. And we will also tackle a little about um, consequences of cardiac surgeries. Okay, so let's begin. So this is the uh, cardiac pathophysiology. Um, the, the heart is a muscle, okay, and the, the tendency... Uh, when it becomes overworked is that uh, it becomes it becomes hypertrophied okay so you see when when the heart is overworked the only way to one of the ways or one of the uh, major ways to to compensate its function is to is for it to be hypertrophied it has to undergo hypertrophy so that it can uh, accommodate accommodate the its its um, function okay aside from that it's dilation of the chamber size and in general grossly you can you can uh, describe this as cardiomegaly okay so you have uh, pathophysiologically, the myocardion is responsible for the pumping mechanism, and mind you, it's also responsible for secreting some uh, atrial peptides. Okay, for uh, what we call uh, what it, it's what we call uh, our um, uh, uh, natriuretic natriuretic peptides, because uh, these are peptides that are responsible for uh, naturesis. Okay. Uh, uh, excreting excess sodium from the blood okay then we have valves okay uh, valves that are when uh, that control the blood flow okay and when when uh, they have they become defective it can uh, lead to various um, disastrous consequences on the heart no for example, dilation, you have a ruptured cord, you have a papillary muscle dysfunction, and the valves is also composed of three layers. No? Conduction system, we already know in our anatomy, in, uh, in the, our histology, that um, the heart uh, is composed of uh, the, the, what they call this, the signals, no? uh, signals created follow some certain points no so i'm talking about um as a node a v node okay down to your purkinje fibers okay the blood supply the heart is mainly relying on oxygen as its source of power okay and it has uh, the, the the pumping and the blood supply of the heart has to be constant no there's no time that the heart uh, becomes uh, devoid of blood because because it's it really needs blood for it to function. Okay, cardiac regeneration is it possible? As of now, it isn't. No, it is still under study because cardiac uh, tissues have very low replicative potential. And these are the effects of the aging of the heart. We have to admit it that the heart in the long run will undergo. Uh, age-related um, degeneration.
okay we we will we will all uh, undergo these changes it's just a matter of time when we talk about the broken heart uh, about the heart no uh, undergoing some uh, uh, changes from the generation we are talking about um, the following no it's being una unable to pump that is what we call a uh, heart failure as uh, it's also in a uh, cardiomyopathy obstruction of flow as in ischemic heart diseases we also have uh, valvular calcifications hypertensive heart diseases regurgitant flow valvular disorders shunted flow that we're talking about congenital heart defects disorders of cardiac uh, conduction we're talking about arrhythmias and rupture of the heart of the or a major blood vessel as in aneurysm or trauma okay? and aside from that we're also considering some cardiovascular genetics if we have those genes that we have inherited from our ancestors from our parents those can surely affect the function of our heart so first of all i'm going to discuss about heart failure so as i said before the heart is a muscle and and um heart failure is a condition in which the heart cannot pump adequately um enough blood uh, in uh, adequately blood to to meet the requirements of the other tissues remember the heart has to pump blood towards the other parts of the body and the mechanisms that it follows are the following the first is this frank starling mechanism this is uh, uh a mechanism uh, in which the, the the heart follows a uh, elastic recoil okay that means uh, upon the supply of blood it expands okay and up until up until uh, the 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 what you call this a uh, ma maximum not maximum point of expansion okay it goes back to contract okay Next is activation of neurohormonal systems, and it involves some hormones such as norepinephrine, renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. Marker adaptations. Okay, uh, this is this is what I mentioned before: the cardiac remodeling. The cardiac myocytes become hypertrophied. Okay, it has to adjust to the um, increasing. Uh, cardiac demand okay. and cardiac heart failure or cardiac failure can result from either you have a systolic dysfunction or the uh, or the the dysfunction on the contraction of the heart okay or the diastolic dysfunction or the di dysfunction or in inability of the heart to relax Okay, those are the examples. Next, so the sustained increase in mechanical work of either the ventric of either ventricles due to pressure overload, volume overload, or trophic signals causes myocytes to increase in size, as we said before. No? Hypertrophy as the compensation of the heart in, due to increased cardiac load, okay, uh, are follows the following patterns no either the 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 heart will have a, a pressure overload hypertrophy in which the the heart will remodel remodel into uh, the cardiac myocytes will remodel into a parallel fas fashion okay the the myocytes will not increase in number but will rearrange themselves into a parallel fashion okay you have increase in but you have increase in the size of the myocytes that's why what's what we call hypertrophy for volume overload hypertrophy you have remodeling of the heart okay in such a way that the myocytes will conform a series fashion okay However, in, in this uh, pathologic state, this is not accompanied by an increase in the capillary numbers. Okay? That's why it is 
associated with heightened metabolic demands that increase cardiac oxygen consumption. Okay, and here is a gross picture of uh, myocardial hypertrophy. Here you have increase in wall size. This is ventricular hypertrophy. This is the cross section. Okay. And at the same time, you have increase in the size of the myocytes. So, if, if you're looking for a figure that can summarize um, all the topics here in the book, this is the one. Okay, All of these factors, such as hypertension or diseases, such as hypertension, valvular diseases, and myocardial infarction, Okay, will all lead to heart failure. Of course, it has to undergo some uh, cardiac remod. The heart has to undergo some cardiac remodeling, as described in this box. Okay. However, not all hypertrophy is pathologic. Okay. There, uh, there is such thing as physiologic hypertrophy, such as hypertrophy of the heart secondary to aerobic exercise. What is special here is that in, in a person undergoing exercise, especially aerobic exercise, there will be an increase in the capillary numbers, okay? thereby increasing the number of blood vessels that will supply the heart, thereby helping the heart in, uh, in case of increased cardiac demand. Okay? Whatever its basis, heart failure is characterized by, take note, Number one, either the heart will not be able to pump forward, okay, or the heart will not be able to what? To pump, uh, as a consequence of forward failure, the there is pooling of the blood in the previous parts. So for example, in the heart, when when there is uh, when there is, for example, right heart failure, you have backflow or pooling of the blood into the inferior vena cava, back down to the liver, back down to the kidneys, back down to the lower extremities. Okay. Congestive, congestive heart failure may be a failure of the left ventricle, the right ventricle, or both. Okay. And there's such thing as uh, natriuretic peptide no? in which when increased, when, when severely increased, will indicate heart failure. This means that uh, you, you have this um, secretion of this, uh, this uh, substance no? in order, uh, the heart tries to, to convince the kidneys to excrete more and more water because or or, or or you know yeah from blood to water okay more and more water so that there will be a relief in the congestion for the left sided heart failure it is a consequence of passive congestion so we're talking about left imagine left side okay it is uh, the con a consequence of passive congestion, okay? Thereby, there will be stasis in the blood in the left chamber, okay? Left chamber, back to the lungs, okay? And the causes are the following. When we say left-sided heart failure, the main cause is R, the following. Very much interrelated are hypert hypertensive heart diseases and ischemic heart diseases. We also have aortic and mitral valvular diseases because when, when you have uh, aortic and mitral stenosis, you also have you also have retention of blood in the in those chambers. In, in, in the ventricle, I'm talking about the ventricle, okay, B ventricles, and thereby causing congestion back to the lungs. 
Okay? And what are what are the clinical manifestations of left-sided heart failure? Left-sided heart failure, you have manifestations on the lungs. So we're talking about difficulty in breathing, difficulty when lying down, that is what we call orthopnea. Okay? For reduction in renal perfusion, yes, it can contribute, okay? But wait until we discuss about right-sided heart failure. That's where uh, renal, um, renal perfusion is greatly reduced, okay? Morphology, of course, we see some myocardial infarcts, okay? But more importantly, we see pulmonary congestion and edema. And because of this congestion, macrophages go to the site of leakage of blood, okay? And eat up the red blood cells. Thus, these macrophages are called hemosiderin-laden macrophages. And these are heart failure cells. So, these heart failure cells are not found in the heart, but they are found in the lungs. And this is uh, pulmonary edema. Okay? This is congestion. Okay? This is edema. Congestion pertains to the leakage of red blood cells. Edema pertains to the filling up of fluid into the alveoli okay right-sided heart failure when we say right-sided heart failure it is the failure of the right side of the heart to pump and the main causes are the following number one left-sided heart failure okay number two we also have uh, uh yeah we also have valvular or mit mitral stenosis as a cause of of right-sided heart failure but we also have a dis a, a lung uh, what they call this a, a a heart disorder which only involves the right side of the heart without having a left-sided heart failure okay that this is what we call core pulmonale so this is a uh, heart core heart pulmonale is lung okay so what is involved here is that the patient first ha uh, had a previous lung disease okay that contributed to pulmonary hypertension such as copd okay we'll talk about it later in hypertensive heart diseases and cardiomyopathy myocarditis tricuspid and pulmonary valvular diseases okay morphology so uh since we mentioned about left-sided heart failure left ventricular hypertrophy okay when the right side of the heart is not able to pump there is backing up of blood back into the previous organs such as the liver we mentioned a while ago uh the vena cava okay um and also to mention the kidneys okay so ren uh clinical manifestations we have renal hypoxia Okay. Since there is fluid retention, okay, renal, the kidney is also affected. Okay. Thus, a patient who has a right-sided heart failure will develop edema or, or bipedal edema more than a patient who has left-sided heart failure. Okay. We also have a con enlarged and congested liver and spleen. Okay, this is what we call a nutmeg nutmeg liver okay uh, uh, we uh, it's called as such because um, histologic uh, grossly the liver looks like a nutmeg it's like a nut you no know, with, with some dark and light areas okay you have decreased uh, left ventricular contractility okay so you have uh, pulmonary venous congestion okay it's either you have backflow into the previous parts, okay, such as the lungs, or you also have a 
decrease in uh, this is a forward failure this is backward failure okay so you have uh, as a consequence this one the, the one in yellow this is the consequence of pulmonary edema this is what we call as a consequence of left-sided heart failure okay when it, it ends up as peripheral edema this is a consequence of right-sided heart failure okay so that is a summary next cardiac development is a uh, consequence of twisting okay in in, in or, or what we call as looping okay in the early first trimester of development of the baby okay so the heart in the beginning is like just like a tube however it it, it twists okay It, it twists from uh, um, what they, it is what they, they call uh, left to right polarity okay until you have the heart that what the heart that we have now okay septation of chambers okay so you can you can uh, follow the diagram but what is important here is that the most common um, defect in the atrium is what we call as or what we uh, what we call as a uh, failure of the septum secundum to close no? that's the most common um, atrial septal defect okay because uh, when we say uh, septum secundum we also have a septum primum in the early part okay ventricles okay this is how uh, the interventricular septum is formed okay and the membranous when when there's a, a hole okay when there's a septal defect in the in the ventricular septum the membranous uh, part of the septum is the most uh, common site of the defect the fetal circulation okay is like um, it follows a dual flow of the blood from um, from the placenta in intrauterine the site of oxygenation is in the placenta okay so the blood flow um oxygenated blood from the placenta okay goes into the following pathway follows the ductus venosus enters the inferior vena cava and supplies the heart okay follow follow the red arrow okay and since um the, the septum or, or the the you see uh, a a f the the patent foramen ovale okay or the septum secundum is still patent the blood courses through from the right atrium directly to the left atrium okay going to the left ventricle and going out to the aorta okay and another pathway for the blood is from the superior vena cava okay from the superior vena cava enters the heart and it enters the pulmonary uh, trunk okay enters the patent ductus venosus okay and since the pressure here is still increased you have an increased pressure in the pulmonary trunk okay there's no way but to 
for it uh, for the blood flow to course sorry there's no way but for the blood flow to course through down to the aorta okay back to the placenta for oxygenation so the one in blue okay in blue and in gray color these are deoxygenated blood the one in red is highly oxygenated blood okay so dual at birth the infant takes a breath and you have decreased resistance in pulmonary vasculature okay and the increase in atrial and, and left atrial pressure versus the right atrial pressure okay you have a closing of the foramen ovale okay and with a placental separation you have decrease in prostaglandins okay, thereby leading to a closure of the ductus arteriosus so in the end at the at uh, at a, a birth of the baby at birth you have closing of the foramen ovale and you also have a, a obliteration of the ductus arteriosus so congenital heart diseases so these are the risk factors okay versus the defect so kindly take note uh alcohol exposure can lead to these uh, cardiac defects okay uh, congenital rubella can lead to what we call as patent ductus arteriosus marfan syndrome can lead to a floppy valve okay what we call as uh, mitral valve prolapse according to frequency okay the most common congenital heart defect is the ventricular septal defect next is the atrial septal defect okay and we are when we are talking about congenital heart defect we're we're dealing on we're dealing with uh, holes in the septum or what we call as shunt it can either the blood flow can either be left to right or right to left okay or we can also talk about um we also we also deal on uh, constrictions or obstructions okay so it's either the blood will um follow left to right or right to left left to right shunting just remember left to right shunting leads to late cyanosis so that means the cyanosis will develop much much later okay because the left side of the heart is oxygenated okay so you have blood flow shunting across the atrial septum or the ventricular septum from left to right Okay. And when we talk about ASD or the atrial septal defect, it is most common in the adult. And the most common site of uh, ASD is the, or, or the most common uh, type of ASD is the ostium secundum. Okay. When we say paradoxical emboli, it is a condition wherein you have an embolus that is uh, contained from the venous circulation okay that goes into the art arterial cir circulation uh, that it passes through the septum okay. Nag, uh, it is some sort of a um, bypass okay next ventricular septal defect it is the most common um overall in general 
It's the most common congenital heart defect among children and the most common type is the membranous. And we say patent ductus arteriosus. So there is a patent um, ductus arteriosus here. No? which supposedly it has to be obliterated but it exists because of um, because of um, maybe a, a, a prostaglandin the presence of uh, prostaglandin okay and because why do we have a um, from from the aorta why does the blood travel back to the pulmonary trunk? It's because the pressure in the aorta is higher compared to, to the pulmonary trunk. And this is the uh, membranous type of ventricular septal defect. Now, let's go to right to left shunting. Okay, before I forget, all this left to right shunting will lead to what we call as Eisenmenger syndrome. Okay? Eisenmenger syndrome is an uncorrected left to right shunt that in the long run will lead to a right to left. So uncorrected left to right that will lead to much much later will lead to a right to left shunt thus leading to late clubbing and late polycythemia. right to left shunting so so remember in right in sorry in left to right shunting remember letter d just have to remember letter d because you have asd vsd and pda for right to left shunting remember it is uh, the manifestation is early cyanosis and the letter that you'll remember is letter t because you have tetralogy of fallow as an example and the transposition of great vessels. In tetralogy of fallow, um, it is composed of the following uh, defects in the heart. The heart has the following defects such as uh, pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy leading to a boot-shaped heart, right uh, overriding aorta okay and vsd okay the initial uh, lesion actually is the pulmonary stenosis which will lead to overload of the right ventricle okay and as a compensation you have you have to have a ventricular septal defect here and you have for for relief of of the blood okay it the blood has to go somewhere okay it has to go to the aorta okay A, the aorta is dilated okay next complete transposition of great vessels that means that the uh, vena vena cava vena cava are located in the in the left side okay and the aorta is located in the right side okay so aorta arising uh, at the right side and the vena cava arising in vena cava um, going into the left side okay next is so these are both scenarios for complete transposition of vessels and what's the difference with the creation of uh, VSD either naturally or or uh, surgically okay or you have a if there's no VSD ventricular septal defect you have a PDA so this is one of the instances wherein a defect no, is a uh, created or naturally created in order to help the heart function 
as normal as possible. So this is the uh, a picture of the transposition of the great arteries. This uh, the, this is the this is the aorta. Okay? This is the vena cava. Obstructive lesions. So there is obstruction because there's constriction in the following areas. Okay? So I'm talking about coarctation of aorta. There is coarctation in this part. in the preductal okay or there is coarctation in the postductal so preductal preductus before the ductus arteriosus okay you have a patent ductus arteriosus or postductal wherein the ductus arteriosus is obliterated okay with uh, PDA you see dilation of the pulmonary trunk remember that there is constriction here okay therefore blood flow is retained and going back you have pulling of blood back to the left ventricle left atrium going back to the lungs going back to the pulmonary trunk so you have a dilated pulmonary trunk whereas in, in without a uh, uh, patent ductus arteriosus you have a dilated aorta. Okay. The adult form of uh, coarctation of aorta leads to upper extremity hypertension and lower extremity hypotension. The infantile or the preductal form is uh, highly associated with Turner syndrome. This is a picture of a postductal type of coarctation of aorta. And this is the uh, tabulation of the anatomic as well as clinical uh, comments about the, co co most, com the most common congen congenital heart defects. This is the summary. Next, ischemic heart diseases. Okay? The main cause is what we call as atherosclerosis, okay? leading to what we call as coronary artery diseases. Okay? So the main cause of ischemic heart diseases is atherosclerosis. Of course, when we say atherosclerosis, Thrombosis as a consequence is also involved. No. So the most common uh, artery that is being occluded or coronary artery or epicardial artery is the left anterior descending artery. And when there is uh, occlusion, okay, we also have occlusion by a thrombus, okay, we also have uh, the uh, changes in the atherosclerotic plaque okay, as manifested in the following syndromes. Okay. Um, acute plaque change is, uh, is um, shown in the following. You have the, the rupture, uh, so, um, superficial erosion, ulceration, fissuring and deep hemorrhage so when you have ischemia we also have a limit in the oxygen supply okay as well as uh, ATP or energy as well as nutrients okay and uh, ischemia can uh, clinically be silent or can manifest as angina pectoris or chest pain okay. or heart attack myocardial infarction and this ischemic heart disease um, is very uh, dangerous for people who have metabolic syndrome 
And when, when we say metabolic syndrome, this is a syndrome composed of the following. You have high blood sugar, you have uh, hypertension, you have um, obesity, and dyslipidemia. All these factors contribute to what we call as a pro-inflammatory state. Clinical presentations, either you have as mild as chest pain, okay, myocardial infarction or heart attack, chronic ischemic heart disease, or sudden cardiac death. Later, we'll be, we'll be differentiating sudden cardiac death from myocardial infarction. So the chest pain can either be a stable angina, which is relieved by rest and relieved by medication, or unstable angina, okay, which is uh, not relieved by rest. Okay? It becomes worse because it is a sign of impending myocardial infarction. Prince metal angina is intermittent chest pain at rest. It's caused by vasospasm. What explains the, the pain okay, in ischemic heart diseases is you have the release of the following chemicals. Okay? Adenosine, bradykinin, that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And what are the changes? What are the changes in the ischemic heart disease, okay, in um, myocardial infarction, okay? You have coagulative necrosis, you have obstruction by, the throm by a thrombus, okay? You also have, you also see neutrophilic infiltration. This is how atherosclerosis will uh, lead to um, obstruction on the uh, blood vessel supplying the heart okay so when a plaque is eroded or disrupted by endothelial injury okay, it exposes the blood uh, with um, with substances that are thrombogenic okay aside from that you also have platelets okay that contribute to the formation of the thrombus. Ninety percent of the MI cases are caused by atherothrombosis. And these are the gross changes of myocardial infarction. First of all, you have dark mottling the first 24 hours, followed by hyperemia. Okay. In the um, for one to three days, okay, within the three days. Next, you have you have hyperemia. However, within the three three to fourteen days, you have hyperemia at the border, but you have central yellow brown softening. And from two weeks to several months, you have scarring, great uh, gray white scar okay and of course histologically you see neutrophils you see uh, until you see granulation tissues and you have a scar at the end and when the when the heart is uh, infarcted it releases uh, some uh, markers okay so that uh, it will be clinically uh, possible to detect that the heart has undergone infarction. So number one, you have release of troponin from the cardiac myocytes. Okay, it is the most specific marker, by the way, troponin I. Okay, because it elevates for as long as two weeks. And for the rest, you have CKMB and myoglobin. Actually, we'll be talking about this again in clean path in cardiac panel. Okay, we follow troponin I here, which becomes elevated for as long as two weeks. And uh, when a coronary artery becomes obstructed, okay, 
the first part of the myocardium that is uh, that becomes ischemic is the one that is distal from the from the coronary artery okay if you notice here if you notice there is this a uh, thin thin area okay near the uh, near the uh, lumen of the heart that is still uh, perfused okay this is possible this is still uh, this is still possible because you also have blood supply coming from the ventricles okay so the coronary coronary arteries that we mentioned about are the following the left anterior descending artery right anterior right uh, coronary artery and the left circumflex artery okay so you have two types of infarction you have transmural which involves the obstruction total obstruction of the coronary artery or the subendocardial infarction which uh, which is caused by a obstruction partial obstruction of the coronary artery okay transmural the whole wall of the heart is ischemic for the subendocardial infarction it's just part of the wall so transmural infarct so you see okay occluded this one the L lad is occluded okay leading to a full thickness is uh, infarction but when you have uh, you have uh, partial obstruction okay you also have subendocardial infarct and the following are complications of myocardial infarction the most common uh, complication is arrhythmia okay so arrhythmia is defined as the uh, uncoordinated uh, contraction of the atria and the ventricles so you have also have a uh, post infarction fibrinous pericarditis okay you also have rupture of the papillary muscles uh, we also have Dressler syndrome okay okay so this is the uh, cross section of a heart that has, that has undergone an uh, infarct okay by the aid of a chemical called tetrazolium chloride it can highlight areas that uh, that uh, liberate lactate dehydrogenase okay this area is an area of infarct okay this area here is an area of fibrosis and this is the the um, histological picture of a heart undergoing myocardial infarction you have neutrophilic infiltration the blue here is fibrosis What are the symptoms of MI? You have prolonged chest pain as long as 30 minutes. Okay? Profuse sweating because of activation of sympathetic nervous system. You have dyspnea and pulmonary congestion because of impaired contractility. So when we talk about pulmonary, pulmonary congestion, there is an impending left-sided heart failure. However, these are uh, yeah these are the classical symptoms however there are some uh, population of patients that are asymptomatic and these refer to diabetic patients these are the complications again of myocardial infarction so there is such thing as chronic ischemic heart diseases okay and it talks about a heart that has undergone um cycles of uh in infarction okay 
It's also possible during uh, uh, after uh, a coronary arterial intervention or bar bypass surgery. And this is the flow chart of the interrelationship of atherosclerotic uh, coronary disease, coronary vessel disease, leading to infarction, leading to arrhythmia. Okay. If the patient survives, in the future, the patient can still have chronic ischemic heart diseases. Okay, arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are what we call as abnormalities in myocardial conduct, conduct, conduction. Okay, there is, thereby you have uh, a uncoordinated um, contraction of the atrium and the ventricle. Okay, ischemic injury is the most common cause of arrhythmias. Uh, and and what are the examples? You have six sinus syndrome, atrial fibrillation. Okay, six sinus syndrome. You have a damaged SA node, atrial fibrillation, and a heart block. Okay, it can also be hereditary. If it's caused by channelopathies. No? Next, uh, we have to discuss on a sudden cardiac death. Okay, it is an unexpected death from cardiac uh, from cardiac causes with or without symptoms within the first twenty four hours. Okay, and the most common mechanism is lethal arrhythmia. Okay, and in this condition. Um, it, yeah, it, it can it can be the causes the prior causes can be ischemic heart diseases. However, it can also be common among patients that do not have ischemic heart diseases. Okay, and I think what happened to uh, one famous vlogger who contracted COVID and suddenly died secondary to cardiac arrest is sudden this is um, sudden cardiac death no? what happened to him is sudden cardiac death okay but we don't know in, in some uh, articles in, in uh, some articles uh, they, we can read that uh, the cause of death is myocardial infarction okay but the acuteness of the condition um, leads us to think that it is secondary to sudden cardiac death okay again what's the difference between heart attack or myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest although cardiac arrest or sudden sudden cardiac death is um, most commonly caused by ischemia okay okay but what it, uh, the difference in concept is that there in, in cardiac arrest you have an electrical problem whereas in heart attack you have a circulation problem okay so let's go to hypertensive heart diseases okay when we say hypertensive heart the side of the heart that is hypertensive undergoes hypertrophy so for example when i talk about left-sided hypertensive heart you have hypertrophy of the left ventricle right-sided hypertensive heart hypertrophy of the right ventricle and what are the causes of a left-sided uh, hypertensive heart you have systemic hypertension okay which we mentioned a while ago will lead to left-sided heart failure and will cause pulmonary symptoms. In the long run, when, when um, 
when this uh, left-sided heart failure can will not be contained to lead to right-sided heart failure okay but a right-sided hypertensive heart the most common again cause is a previous left-sided heart failure okay which is caused by systemic hypertension most commonly it can also be caused with valvular disorders second is a condition what is that is what we call as core pulmonale no? which is uh, a yeah, the patient may not have systemic hypertension or left-sided heart failure but the patient has a previous pulmonary disease leading to pulmonary hypertension leading to a overwork right side of the heart leading to right-sided heart failure and that is what we call isolated right-sided heart failure or what we call core pulmonale okay we are done with right-sided uh, uh, we're done with hypertensive heart diseases so let's go to valvular heart diseases so valvular diseases can be congenital and acquired okay when we say uh, congenital we're talking about uh, um, bicuspid valves okay uh, mitral valve prolapse when it's secondary to a connective uh, tissue disorder or uh, acquired okay such as uh, caused by a an infection okay leading to stenosis build up an um, uh, infection leading to build up of vegetations on the valves leading to stenosis okay and regurgitation and from from the acquired among the acquired valvular disorders you have stenosis which is always chronic or secondary to calcification okay or regurgitation regurgitation, regurg regurgitation is uh, defined as backflow of the blood either you have it's caused by a rupture of the cords or scarring okay so these are the valvular disorders okay uh, actually the one the, the contents of the table are the the causes of the valvular disorder okay, rheumatic heart diseases as you mentioned you can also see infective endocarditis okay but all these can lead to either a stenotic valve or a mite or a regurg regurgitant valve or valve that uh, undergoes um, regurgitation so what's the consequence of having this uh, stenotic and uh, and uh, regurgitant valve no or, or uh, for example uh, valve regurgitation okay so you have murmurs when we say systolic murmurs these are murmurs that are created during the systolic phase of the heartbeat okay systolic phase so when during the systole during systole the valves the valves that close are what the atrioventricular atrioventricular valves so we're talking about uh, mitral and tricuspid valves okay uh, during diastole the valves that close are the what aortic valve and the pulmonary valve okay so um when 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 during the systole it it has to the valves have have to close mitral and tricuspid valve have to close but a murmur is created because of regurgitation or backflow i'm talking about mitral and tricuspid regurgitation Okay. However, it also involves a systolic murmur is also involved in aortic stenosis because during 
um, systole wherein the aortic valve aortic valve has to open okay a murmur is created because you have a stenotic aortic valve okay so for your convenience uh, kindly memorize the sound that is created kind of murmur that is created for each type of valvular disorder okay you will uh, uh, you will be able to know the mechanism of the murmur in uh, your in third year so next in diastolic diastolic murmur okay so diastole is uh, ventricular relaxation okay you have a closure of the of the aortic and pulmonary valves so closure of aortic and pulmonary valves so that means when you have a backflow okay a murmur is created or when you have a uh, stenosis of the mitral valve which in during diastole it has to open okay it has to open okay you also have a murmur so kindly memorize okay the the murmurs that are created okay these are the uh, valvular um, diseases that I will talk about um, in the following slides the degenerative valvular diseases rheumatic heart diseases infective endocarditis non-infective vegetations carcinoid, carcinoid heart diseases and prosthetic valves when we talk about degenerative valve diseases it mainly pertains to calcifications on the valve particularly the aortic valve due to wear and tear due to aging no? of course accompanied by atherosclerosis and uh, there okay so um, another another degenerative valve is what we call as the myxomatous mitral valve it is another term for mitral valve prolapse okay the valve uh, becomes very thick floppy and rubbery so that it allows regurgitation okay back to the previous chamber there's a ballooning of the leaflets back to the previous chamber see uh, the, the sound is, is that is created by mitral valve prolapse is mid systolic click and this is at risk for infections infective endocarditis and thrombosis and uh, histologically you see thickening of the valve no? a thin thick spongiosa and a thin fibrosa because of thick spongiosa is secondary to collagen Um, so this is a figure comparing different uh, vegetative uh, valvular disorders no? number one you have right uh, you have uh, rheumatic heart diseases okay in which the vegetations are small warty inflammatory along the valves of line closure next is the um, infective endocarditis where is wherein the lesion is large irregular and destructive okay whereas in the third one this is the non-thrombotic endocarditis you have non-destructive non-destructive vegetations and the fourth one is a vegetation caused by lupus okay which is also destructive so where is the destructive infective endocarditis and uh, 
Lehman Sachs endocarditis okay? or lupus endocarditis. Rheumatic valvular diseases are a consequence of the most common consequence is a throat infection and it's very common among children. And the and this is secondary to a reaction um, or, or a hypersensitivity okay, of uh, antibodies and complement okay, antibodies against the M protein of the beta hemolytic strep. So the, the, the infectious agent is the streptococcus pyogenes. Okay. So the incubation period is two to three weeks after throat infection, and the vegetations, okay, um, are described as the following. So you have a mitral fish mouth or buttonhole stenosis on the mitral valve. By the way, the most common valve that is affected in valvular disease in general is the mitral valve so you have mitral thickening histologically it leads to some sort of a uh, necrosis and this is what we call as ascoff body okay and within the ascoff body we see macrophages called anisco cells Okay, and signs and symptoms of rheumatic heart diseases are summarized in the following mnemonic. You have J, joints, okay, joint manifestation, joint arthritis, carditis, nodules, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum or rash, and Sydenham's chorea or involuntary muscle movements. Next. Infective endocarditis. What's the difference between uh, the rheumatic heart disease and infective endocarditis? The difference is that in infective endocarditis, the infectious agent is really the one in causing the the um, the uh, endocarditis. Okay, so you have destructive, friable, bulky vegetations. Risk factors, a prior uh, intravenous drug abuse, you have dental procedures, okay, among the rest, okay. And you have two types, acute and subacute. When we say acute, it is a, an endocarditis that attacks normal valves, okay. Subacute, it's not the first case of endocarditis, but it is a, 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 fall, a, a case of endocarditis that follows damaged valves or scarred or formed valves. And the most likely agent in acute endocarditis is Staphylococcus aureus. Okay? Also have HASEC organisms and fungi. For the subacute, the, the, the most likely agent is Streptococcus viridans. But the more fatal one is the acute endocarditis. Okay. So what are the signs and symptoms? It is, uh, the signs and symptoms are um, summarized with the following mnemonics. We have fever, rot spots, rot spots, no? uh, or these are retinal hemorrhages, Murmurs, okay. So either you have a, a, a murmur caused by a tricuspid uh, stenosis or mitral stenosis. Then uh, J Janeway lesions, okay. These are painless um, palm or sole erythematous lesions. Anemia, nail bed splinter hemorrhages, okay. So these hemorrhages and uh, rot spots, etc., these are thrombi no? or emboli that are being lodged into the um, small vessel circulation. 
And we also have splenomegaly. The diagnostic criteria for infective endocarditis is what we call as the Duke's criteria. Duke's criteria. Okay. Complications, either you have glomerulus nephritis, secondary to immune complex deposition, sepsis, arrhythmias, and emboli. Next type of endocarditis is the non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, and it happens in patients that are healthy or debilitated, but more particularly among debilitated patients because the, the other term for this one is marantic endocarditis. Marantic, uh, marasmus ba? Marasmus. Okay? And these are um, small or small to medium-sized vegetations okay, among the, uh, among, along the uh, valve closure. Okay? You have the sterile and non-destructive lesions. Okay, which is composed of just a, uh, a uh, fibrin and platelets. Okay? And it does not contribute to a damage on the valve. Next is lupus endocarditis or the Liebman Sachs endocarditis. So just remember that the patient here has a history of lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus and or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is secondary to complex deposition. Okay. Carcinoid heart diseases. This is a uh, valvular disorder also secondary to what we call as carcinoid syndrome. Okay. Um, what happens is that the somewhere along the other parts of the body, such as the GI tract, you have a tumor, a carcinoid tumor that produces serotonin metabolites. Okay? So these serotonin metabolites travel through the blood, goes to the heart, okay? Goes to the heart. And only the left side of the heart is right side of the heart i'm sorry right side of the heart is affected because the left side of the heart is spared because the pulmonary vascular bed degrades the metabolites okay and the cardiac and the clinical manifestation are the following flushing diarrhea dermatitis and bronchoconstriction and this is the gross and the histologic um, picture so you have a coating, coating on the endocardium, okay? And uh, histologically, you see thickened intima with collagen fibers. So rich in mucopolysaccharide. So uh, prosthetic cardiac valves or valvular replacement are without danger of course no when 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 a particular valve is already defective um aside from giving antibiotics okay or steroid or uh, we also get we all, the the, the uh, more what they call it, uh, more invasive um invasive uh, management is by replacement of the of the valves okay so there are two types of valves. You have mechanical, okay, which is the th synthetic or the bioprosthetic, which is the porcine type. The mechanical is more durable, but it, require, it requires chronic anticoagulation. For bioprosthetic, it, it is less durable, but it does not require anticoagulation. And these are the complications of valvular replacement. Of course, you have thrombosis. You also have further infection. Okay. Also have leak. Okay. Paravalvular leak. Okay. 
So, cardiomyopathies. The, these are the kinds of cardiomyopathies. You have dilated cardiomyopathy, where, where it is characterized by dilation of chambers and the thinning out of the atrial and or ventricular walls. Next is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where it is characterized by a thickened ventricular wall. Next is uh, you have restrictive cardiomyopathy, okay, wherein uh, you don't have much thickening, but there is infiltration of substance in the myocardium affecting its diastolic function or relaxation. So, dilated cardiomyopathy, these are the causes. Number one, genetic. Number two, alcoholic. Okay. And what's the problem here? When the heart is dilated, okay, it's already flabby and it does not contract well. Systolic dysfunction. Next, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you have impairment of diastole or relaxation okay restrictive cardiomyopathy you have again impairment of relaxation so examples are amyloidosis no? and fibrosis there is such a uh, cardiac disease called left ventricular non-compaction it is a congenital cardiomyopathy it's a what's distinct here is it's spongy appearance of the ventricles dilated cardiomyopathy again mentioned about systolic dysfunction it's the most common cardiomyopathy and although dilated you also the, the heart also has concurrent hypertrophy And this is a slide comparing the proteins that are affected in different types of cardiomyopathy. You have uh, D, dilated cardiomyopathy, such as uh, the proteins involved dystrophin and desmin. Okay, the one in red. Okay, next is uh, car cardio um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You have involvement of myosin. Okay. For and and for both, you have uh, these uh, proteins: the actin and beta myosin heavy chain. Um, the gross picture of uh, dilate, uh, dilated heart is you have dilation of all the chambers, and since you have already have a systolic dysfunction or dysfunction in contraction the patient will have a moral thrombi okay there's a tension of blood causing from a thrombus that is to, to be formed out of the retention next uh, in um, dilated uh, cardiomyopathy there isn't uh, very very much change no, in the in the histology okay although upon uh, upon staining with prussian blue you can see uh, um, stained hemosiderin if if the di uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is secondary to iron overload signs and symptoms again you have dyspnea signs and symptoms of what easy fa fa fatigability okay and we have signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure okay so that means you have uh, the patient will have
pulmonary symptoms, difficulty in breathing. Okay. There's a particular type of um, dilated uh, cardiomyopathy which is uh, characterized by invasion of uh, the myocytes with uh, fat, fat cells. Okay. This is what we call arrhythmogenic right ventricular myopathy. Okay? It's secondary to genetic mutations on the placoglobin and desmin. Another special type of dilated cardiomyopathy is what we call as the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Okay? It's, a second, it's the other term for broken heart syndrome. And it's caused by over secretion or over stimulation of sympathetic system okay leading to a rupture one of one of the consequences is a rupture of chordae tendine hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh again it has a uh, impaired diastolic feeling or impaired relaxation the heart is thick heavy and hypercontractile you have outflow obstruction and yeah we mentioned about the beta myosin heavy chain a while ago and the gross picture is that in um, hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy you have asymmetric septal hypertrophy okay um, whereas in uh, what you call this in uh, hypertensive um, hypertensive heart diseases the uh, hypertrophy is concentric here hyper the hypertrophy is asymmetric or what we call as eccentric because the septal wall okay the sep the septal wall the septum is more hypertrophied compared to the walls you see uh, there is thickening of the ve ventricular walls leading to a narrowing of the chamber okay what we call a banana like longitudinal section okay the hypertrophy of the myocytes can be uh, as haphazard as this figure okay as well as you see uh, interstitial fibrosis so you have reduced stroke volume due to massive hypertrophy and it's very common among uh, athletes okay young athletes clinical problems okay consequences can also have a thrombus formation also have infective endocarditis chf and death okay so this is a figure comparing dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy restrictive cardiomyopathy is uh, a cardiomyopathy secondary to an infiltration of a particular su particular substance into the myocardium either you have amyloid or fibrosis okay so uh, here you have amyloid deposition okay this is a case of amyloidosis no? and under the polarized light okay, you have apple green birefringence Restrictive cardiomyopathy has three forms. You have amyloidosis, okay. 
you have endomyocardial fibrosis which is secondary to nutritional deficiency or parasitic infections it's very common among Africans children and Loeffler endocarditis okay which is also caused by hypereusinophilia Myocarditis. Myocarditis is another type of cardiomyopathy, uh, but what's uh, special here is there is inflammation secondary to an infection. So these are the agents, infectious agents. It can also be brought about by immune system, uh, uh, immune mediated reactions. Okay. So, viral myocarditis, the most common cause is Coxsackie virus. For the non-viral, you have the following. Trypanosoma cruzi, Toxoplasma gondi, Trichinella spiralis, and Borrelia burgdorferi. For the non-infectious, it is caused by SLE and hypersensitivity myocarditis grossly the myocarditis uh, appears flabby no? in the advanced stage or mottled with pale and hemorrhagic areas histologically you have edema uh, interstitial inflammatory infiltrates okay, and myocardial injury so lymphocytic myocarditis you see lymphocytes okay. when you say hypersensitivity myocarditis you see eosinophils when we say mm, giant cell uh, myocarditis you see infiltration of giant cells Okay. When you say Chagas myocarditis, you also see the, um, since it is a parasitic infection, you see eosinophils. You also see the infectious agent, the trypanosoma. So what are the signs and symptoms? Very much like, uh, it is asymptomatic, no? um, but when it is symptomatic, it may mimic MI, myocardial infarction. So it can occasionally progress to dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. So pericardial diseases. So when we talk about pericardial diseases, it uh, we are talking about the pericardium or the or the epicardium, no? So either you have non-inflammatory conditions such as hydropericardium, okay, or hemopericardium. So blood is contained here, or you have acute pericarditis, no, serous pericarditis, fibrinous serous fibrinous uh, pericarditis or purulent superative pericarditis hemorrhagic pericarditis okay or chronic or healed pericarditis and the two types are adhesive pericarditis and constrictive pericarditis what's the difference between adhesive and constrictive for adhesive pericarditis the adhesion is from the pericardium with the surrounding structures such as the lungs Okay. or the rib cage and diaphragm okay for uh, compared to constrictive pericarditis you have a an adhesion a, or a, a encasement of a scar okay that limits limits diastolic uh, expansion or relaxation So these are the 
causes of pericarditis. Cardiac tumors. So the most common cardiac tumor are metastatic. No? These are tumors that are not found in the heart. And the most common site or source of this uh, tumor is from the lungs. However, if, you ha if there are uh, cardiac uh, neoplasms, okay, these are uncommon. However, however mostly are benign, such as uh, myxomas. Okay? Angiosarcomas of the heart are very rare. And, and uh, the common characteristic for uh, primary neoplasms in the heart is that it is uh, it offers it, it has a bald and ball and valve or wrecking ball destruction okay um, most likely it looks like a thrombus but uh, the components is it is composed of neoplastic cells Okay, so this is myxoma, most common adult primary, adult primary um, tumor, cardiac tumor, and wrecking ball. It is a wrecking ball uh, um, effect creates a wrecking ball effect, gelatinous but hemorrhagic, and it causes syncopal episodes due to obstruction. Okay, you have hyperchromatic nuclei. Okay, and mucous polysaccharide substance. Rhabdomyoma, um, myxoma is most uh, likely or most commonly found in the left atrium, whereas uh, rhabdomyoma, it is most commonly found in the ventricles. Most commonly in uh, prime um, in children, okay highly associated with tuberous sclerosis and hamartomas. Histologically, so they look like spider cells. Okay, because of a cytoplasm that connects cell membrane to the nucleus. Other cardiac tumors are lipomas, composed of adipose tissues, papillary fibroelastomas, which looks like look like sea anemones. Okay? and cardiac angiosarcomas, which are rare. And what are the uh, route of metastasis? Okay. These are a lot. No? You have lymphatic, you have hematogenous, and you have direct extension. So the last part. Cardiac transplantation is without uh, is um, not without any danger okay? because of this main problem, allograft rejection. Okay? So the, it's either classic cellular rejection, you have interstitial lymphocytic inflammation, okay? which causes myocyte damage, and antibody rejection, okay? which upon uh, immunohistochemical staining, okay? Um, it's up, it's uh, detected uh, using this uh, C4D. Okay. Complications: you have allograft vasculopathy. Okay. Uh, I think we're talking about um, um, connecting uh, blood vessels no, from the recipient. Uh, to the to, uh, from the donor to the recipient blood vessel okay Co infections and cancer okay so b cell lymphomas are highly related to cardiac transplantation so this is the allograft rejection the first lymphocytic infiltrate Okay. Next for B, for B you have um, antibody rejection. Okay. Letter C you have C4D component. Okay. 
we have outlining of the capillaries. For letter D, this is what we call allograft vasculopathy. Okay? With severe diffuse concentric intimal thickening producing critical stenosis. So very much like uh, what we learned in uh, blood vessels, no? the um, consequence of stenting, no? which is a uh, um, fibrous intimal hyperplasia. For cardiac devices such as stents, um, repairs, pacemakers, valve replacement, ventricular assist devices, these are not without dangers also because first of all the risk is mechanical, mechanical failure, second thrombus formation, and infections. However, through consistent monitoring, okay, benefits can outweigh the risk. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day.